soil is the stomach of the plant. Yep. The plants don't have an internalized stomach, they have a, an external stomach, and they spend 30% of their photosynthetic energy exuding sugary sap into the root zone, which nourishes a symbiotic community of bacteria and fungi upon which their digestion depends. It's exactly the same in the human stomach. We, we host a symbiotic community of bacteria upon which our digestion and our health depends. So when we look at the soil anew, we can imagine it as the collective stomach of all the plants on earth, digesting and feeding. And what a beautiful kind of metaphor that is. And uh, it, it just changes one's attitude towards the soil. Patrick Holden is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Patrick is the founding director and chief executive of the Sustainable Food Trust. After studying biodynamic agriculture at Emerson College, he established a mixed community farm in Wales in 1973, producing at various times wheat for flour production, sold locally carrots and milk from an 85 cow, a Shire dairy herd, now made into single farm cheddar style cheese, mm, my favorite. He was the founding chairman of British Organic Farmers in 1982 before joining the Soil Association where he worked for nearly 20 years and during which time the organization led the development of organic standards and the market for organic foods. His advocacy for major global transition to more sustainable food systems now entails international travel and regular broadcasts and talks at public events. He is patron of the UK Biodynamic Association and was awarded the CBE for service to organic farming in 2005. Patrick is passionate about the application of nature's principles of harmony to food and farming, which is explored in the Sustainable Food Trust's latest initiative, the Harmony Project. Patrick has spoken to wonderful people all around the world at events in the United States, to His Royal Highness Prince Charles, uh, as well as environmental activist uh, George Monboy. Patrick, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you. Well, thank you very much indeed for uh, inviting me. I, I would, I, I'm so glad that you found the time and that you can make it. It's, it's beautiful to have you here. We have a lot in common, a lot of things that we've thought about and been working on a long time. So we're going to have more than enough to speak about this, this entire time. And we'll probably get down into some rabbit holes and get into some deeper subjects. And we'll, we'll just let it play out however it is, because there's a lot of important topics we need to cover today to raise awareness and to uh, move the shift. I want to uh, start first and foremost uh, with a question of how have you weathered this crazy time, this pandemic, uh, Black Lives Matters, the Brexit and all the crazy things that have kind of really bubbled to the surface this year. Having been doing this for over 40 years, uh, I imagine You've been speaking about, you know, what's coming, how we need to prepare, how we should change, maybe the future of farming and, and, and what we could do better. Uh, has any of that given you resilience or what can you give us a little journey of what, what you've experienced just this year during the pandemic? Well, yes, do I start with um, Brexit or the pandemic? Um, uh, Brexit was, uh, you know, an interesting and unfortunate development in our history. Um, I was not one of those who voted for it. In fact, funnily enough, I was in America when the vote came through. I couldn't believe it was happening. Um, so that's been an ongoing saga, not over yet, as you know. We could talk about that a little bit. Um, it has got one or two silver linings. The only so obvious silver lining I can see is that um, it has resulted in a, a restructuring of agricultural policy in England and the devolved nations, of which, of course, Wales, where I'm speaking to you now from, the farm in Wales, is one. 
And some of the new proposed policy for agriculture is seriously enlightened. I would describe the, um, the Welsh draft agricultural policy scheme, which has not yet been launched, as being effectively the world's first government scheme to promote regenerative agriculture. So that's, uh, that's, that's something good. Um, as far as the pandemic is concerned, it's disrupted our lives, obviously, as it has everyone else's. Um, it, we, our cheese sales, which is the main product that now we sell from the farm, was going all over the world, still is going all over the world, which is a strange thing to say when we believe in local food, but you know, that's just one of the paradoxes of the situation we find ourselves in. Yeah. Uh, also quite a lot to restaurants, um, that all stopped, of course. And then we decided to go for the first time in our 47 year history to once a day milking uh, because we, you know, just thought it would be easier. And we were, you know, this phrase we have furloughing, which means kind of the chancellor of the exchequer pays the wages. And we were worried about the income stopping because the cheese making stopped because we couldn't make it work. But anyway, fast forward a year or whatever it is. No, it's, it's nine months, isn't it? Since it all yeah. went serious and cheese sales have picked up again. Uh, we are making cheese. The demand is strong. Uh, I think the farm is fine. The farm is seriously resilient. We have been less resilient, but our spirit is resilient. And so I think we're okay. And uh, we will come through this and build the farming system into the future. And I feel very excited about that, actually. I think that the, the farm, I always like to think, if the food system is an organism, the farm is the cell. And we need to make the cells healthy. And if we have healthy cells, we have a healthy organism. So from the ground up, um, the work that we've been doing on this farm for now nearly 50 years, I think is, um, it affirms my belief in the system that we both believe in, because it's, one, it's visible here and um, it's exciting. And I think the future is extremely exciting, potentially, if we can get through these turbulent times and all the rest of it. And, as for the Black Lives Matter developments, I mean, that is a massive conversation we could have, but I think there's no doubt about it that there's some sort of karmic uh, inherited anger in the, say in the African-American community, but amongst pe black people and people of color who have been exploited all over the world. I also think there's a kind of inherited sense of guilt that white people have. I mean, I'm not free of this, the United Kingdom is not free of this. We were a country with, well, where we exploited uh, people all over the world. We were participants in slavery. And my own great grandfather was part of quelling the Indian uprising. So there's a lots of stuff there that I think is still working itself out of, of us, the, the ones who exploited and the exploited ones in different ways. And it's a very difficult thing to talk about, but I think it, it needs to be talked about. So if you want to go there, we can go there. But well, anyway, summary, things are okay. Good, that's so wonderful to hear. I do want to kind of go deeper into two, two little subjects that you mentioned, and I, I think they, they're cross-cutting in, into some respects. So people of color uh, in the United Kingdom, there's been numbers of upwards of 200,000 uh, immigrant workers uh, working in food production. Uh, clear up to some some seasons, 600,000 is, uh, is what I've heard, whether that, that's accurate or not. But, you know, a substantial amount of immigrant workers every year, uh, which had a strong influence also on the Brexit vote and uh, ties also to people of color because most of those immigrant workers are coming from other places that, uh, uh, that there's a lot of different cultures and, and, and races and, and uh, colors involved. In, well, in, uh, in our well. case, of course, most of the um, economic migrants were from Eastern Europe. So they weren't or aren't people of color. Okay. Um, but um, it is a very interesting thing that how could we have, and of course, it's exactly the same in the United States. We've kind of denigrated the social and economic status of people who work on the land and produce food to a kind of underclass. And in America, of course, it's the Hispanic population, but in the United Kingdom, it's Eastern Europeans who still have a good work ethic and are actually, interestingly enough, much fitter and healthier than we are. And it's terrible, really, it seems to me, that we've created this divide between those of us that eat the food and some kind of economic underclass who produce it. That has to change. 
And I think it needs to change. And I think it needs to change, frankly, for the mental and health and, and physical health of the people who have been doing the exploitation, because it's good to work on the land. It's good to use one's body to produce food. So I think we have to, to change a lot, including our own attitude towards physical work on the land. I totally agree. And, and what, where I wanted to maybe go, go a little bit deeper and see what, just since you're on the ground and you work with tons of farmers in the United Kingdom, but also around the world, um, if, if you saw during, during this time, uh, mainly the organic regenerative farmers that you work with, or maybe even you had uh, in, uh, insights into others, was it such a thing that because now because of the pandemic and this lockdown and, and the Brexit that those immigrant workers weren't there anymore, that a lot of the farms, whether it was small or, or bigger farms, didn't have enough hands or laborers to, to, to harvest the food. Uh, and, and, and I was receiving stories and some actual, you know, uh, uh, some friends of mine were actually saying, yeah, we're having to till the food back into the ground because we don't have enough people to, to harvest and, uh, and, and disseminate the food and, and not enough takers. Were, were you experiencing that as well? Or did you know others that this was occurring and happening? Well, we weren't experiencing it because the the people that work on this farm are mostly local people. When we used to grow carrots, which we did on some scale, we did have some Eastern European workers who came here. But I think that in relation to the main areas where uh, these workers come from Eastern Europe, which is really the Eastern counties now, to pick um, vegetables and fruit, there was a shortage, but some people still came over and some people actually live in the UK. I mean, they moved over and they live in these kind of strange work camps which have been established by some of the big growers um i think yes there's been some plowing in of crops and yes the uh, work the farmers in the eastern counties tried to employ british people and found they were useless which is interesting it's, it's very <laughs> there's, no, there's no good work ethic amongst young people of our country which is kind of telling isn't it um, it's, it's hard work. I mean, there, yeah. uh, you and I have both experienced it, no matter whether it's a animal husbandry or animal agriculture or actual organic farming. It, it's hard work. It's early hours. Yeah. It's, it, 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 and there's a trick. There's a trade to it. So uh, there, there's ways to do it efficiently and quickly and, and to, to do that. And, and a lot of us are missing those skills today around, all around they're, the world. They really are. Thing. Yeah, that's so true. I went to Immokalee in Florida. Um, at the suggestion of Eric Schlosser, who wrote Fast Food Nation, and I saw the workers in Immokalee, and it's humbling. You know, I mean, they're out of the fields all day doing, you know, 10, 12 hour days, and they can work fast. And I've got enough carrot picking experience and carrot weeding experience under my belt to know about what that feels like. And it's not just bad, actually, it's meaningful physical work with a real result, and we ought to give it a higher status, both economically and culturally, because it's actually part of the development, in my view, of a harmonious human being to work physically with our bodies. Do you, you see that as a, that ties into some other things that you're working with, the Harmony Project and the Sustainable Food Trust. Uh, do, do you see that as a direct tie-in to the true cost, or do you see that more as fair wage, uh, fair trade type of a thing or or uh, because that's a big aspect of the 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 growers the harvesters the producers of the food to process it into cheese and to uh, get it ready to go to market um do you see that as, as a part of the true cost or is that a separate line item so to say no i think it's absolutely connected you may know that we produced a report called the hidden costs of uk food which was first published in 2017 but we refreshed it last year and the headline of the report is for every pound that we spend could be a euro or a dollar we spend on food in the supermarket there's another hidden pound split roughly 50 50 between damage to the environment depletion of natural capital pollution that kind of stuff destruction of biodiversity and damage to public health and that extra pound doesn't appear on the price of the food so the real price of the food is double what we're paying for it at least and of course you're right that part of that hidden cost is the cultural human 
externalities which are improperly valued or not valued at all. So we're not just destroying environmental capital. We're not just destroying, um, uh, we're not just polluting and causing climate change. We're not just damaging public wealth. We're damaging cultural health. And the, pro the period of industrial agriculture has been a kind of mining operation, an extractive industry where we've removed people from the land. And that is that should be monetized. We should recognize, I mean, Bandana Sheba, I heard her say the other day in a meeting that it's worth trillions of dollars, the destruction of the smallholder capital, which was represented by the skills of the people, the people themselves, their livelihood and all that goes with that. We haven't put a value on any of that. So we've got terrible food systems in a kind of race to the bottom where, you know, there's huge scale, hardly any people on the land, exploitation of its fertility through chemicals and everything else. And now surely we've, we've reached the bottom with hardly any soil fertility left. And a lot of this is about uncosted externalities of a negative nature, but also unvalued positive externalities. So in order to put things right, we need to make the polluter pay. We need to redirect the subsidies and we need to put a proper value on all the those aspects of food production system that I've just mentioned. We can do that, and I think there's an appetite to do that now. And if we did do it, things would change dramatically, and they must, because otherwise we're going to have an unlivable planet and an ecological cat catastrophe because of the destruction of biodiversity. I totally agree, and and it's uh, the, you know there's that that big factor also the human capital is just not valued at all of what what people do and and there's this great saying uh, from Carolyn Steele uh, might have came up with it I'm uh, uh, or, or in a conversation of ours is when you uh, cheapen food you cheapen life and uh, there is really a value in, in this not only the total environmental cost of uh, uh, of food and, and you know the natural capital that we need to make sure that is accounted for and, and included in that process, but also that uh, when we, like in 2008, when we had the big financial uh, issues around the world, where we turned food into a commodity, and so we have people who are used to investments and, and commodities um, who have no idea about farming or how to produce food cheapening food and just let's produce it as quick and fast as possible. It doesn't make matter what goes into it or how, how many chemicals and, and it's really cheap in food, which is then in turn cheap in life, our health and many other ripple effects that, that carry over to us all. Um, you're, you touched upon it nicely and, and I, that, that's where I really wanted to go is the uh, sustainable uh, food press is really producing super reports uh, and has done, you know, not only the 2017 report uh, for the United Kingdom, the hidden costs of food, which has now been updated, but other reports that you've worked on and you're probably continuing to move forward with those. There are some key pillars in there of, of things that you, um, in this food system, the food web, you kind of touch upon that actually absolutely need to change or be improved upon uh, can you go through and kind of give us an update and tell us what those are and, and explain those a little bit better, what your your mis mission and vision is with the Sustainable Food Trust? Well, um, you know, we're not tackling everything. We're a very small organization uh, with a big mission, but there are only about a dozen of us working for the organization, uh, which was founded in 2010, 2011. Um, we, we're working internationally and uh, we are particularly active, obviously, in the UK where I'm based, but also in America. We have a 501c3, so we have some wonderful supporters and donors in the US. Um, one of the things we did very early on was we held a series of meetings, um, one in uh, at Georgetown University in Washington, um, where Prince Charles spoke um, and... We also had a meeting, uh, a big conference in San Francisco, the true cost of American food, where we were looking at these externalities and this uh, discipline uh, of true cost accounting. I think we were kind of one of the midwives of nursing that, that approach to looking at the real cost of food and bringing it into the world to the point where now I think it's widely accepted uh, that 
uncosted negative externalities are a major distorting effect on the whole food system of the world. Until we put that right, we can't really drive change in the way that we need to because the apparent cheapness, which is we know is a delusion of food in the shops, is still having a huge grip on people because they believe, unfortunately, wrongly, that the price is an indication of, of value when in fact the opposite is the case. So we need to put that right. But arising from that, um, we got involved with um, Teeb Agri Food, horrible acronym, Pavan Sukhdev, an Indian man who was involved with the natural capital community and who was one of the sort of architects of the whole thing, the whole framework of putting a value on nature. But we realized that there was no common framework for measuring because it, in order to monetize, to, to value, you have to first measure. But there was no common framework for measuring the impact of different farming systems on the outcome of the farming practice. So I'm speaking here about, let's just take this farm. We're farming here. We're having an effect on the soil, the water, the biodiversity, the nutrient cycling, the emissions, the energy and resource use, the livestock health and the crop health of the plants and animals we grow on the farm. And of course, as we've already discussed, the social and cultural impacts. But all the academics who were kind of measuring those things and putting a monetary, monetary value on them were using a different framework. And exactly the same thing is true with a farm. So for instance, here we have five different audits every year. We have Soil Association, which is our organic audit. And of course I will, used to work for the Soil Association and I was one of the architects of the organic standards. But we also have other audits. We have Red Tractor and then some farmers have Leaf and then some farmers have animal welfare audits. And then there's the government, in, you know, in the case of America, the Farm Bill, but in our case, the Welsh government, who want us to provide data every year in order to judge whether we can be eligible for various environmental schemes and indeed the organic farming scheme. Now, all these audits are using different measurements, different frameworks. They all cost quite a lot of money and they tie a lot of time up and bureaucracy. And we convened a meeting of farmers and land managers about five years ago to discuss all this. We said, this is crazy. We're the farmers. We're having all these audits. None of them give me or any of the other farmers good information about whether we were more sustainable than last year. So, I, for instance, I get two inspections from the Soil Association each year. I'm telling this against myself because I designed the damn thing. Do I know whether my soil organic matter is better than last year? No, I don't. Do I know whether the biodiversity has increased? No, I don't. Do I know any of those things I just mentioned? Basically, no. I just know that I haven't cheated because the Soil Association inspector checked. And that really isn't good enough because now we need, if we're going to address climate change and irreversible biodiversity loss, we need to be able to measure the impact of every farm in the world and we need to measure the impact against a common framework. And that is what we've been working on over the last five years with this group of farmers and land managers of huge diversity. I mean, some of them are large intensive arable farms, some of them are stock farms, some of them are small organic farms. We found that there's an amazing atmosphere of trust between us all because we all want to measure our impacts. And we've come up with this framework, which we think should be the basis of a new form of communication between all farmers all over the world, regardless of what kind of farming they do or their scale because it can apply. I mean, if you think about it, you could be a smallholder farmer in Zimbabwe or India or anywhere. What do you want to know? You want to know the impact of your farming practice on the soil, on the biodiversity, on the nutrient cycling, on the energy and resources, the things I just said. And yeah. if we could have a common way of measuring that, this would be amazing. Because if you go back to the COP21, where the French minister, Stéphane La Folle, came up with this wonderful idea of four per thousand, and this was quatre pour mille. And this was the idea behind this was that every farmer in the world should build their soil organic matter. Well, if we were measuring that using a common framework, then we could have a COP26, which we have to be hosting in Glasgow. And our hapless Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, maybe, who knows, could announce that we want to join with the rest of the world in developing a harmonized framework for measuring our impact on our soil then we could make farming part of addressing climate change. That's just one example. So we are, as you can tell, I'm quite excited about this because I think that actually you could overlay this new way of measuring our sustainability impacts over all the existing certification schemes, including organic. 
And I personally think, we talked about this briefly before we started chatting, but I think the organic certification scheme is too binary. You know, the inspector comes here, you are or you are not. Well, it isn't like that really, is it? You know, no, this is no, a, st no. a stairway to heaven. We need to get better every year. Everyone needs to be in now. It's not just about an elite market for rich people. It's about an existential crisis. We all need to be in. And we need to have a sustainability assessment framework, which is inclusive, not exclusive. End of rant. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm totally in line with you, and I agree. It's, it's. Uh, I, I mentioned in our discussion earlier. I feel that the bar is too low, but you said it so eloquently. It's too binary. It's, uh, it's very similar to the sustainable development goals or to other GRI reporting. Basically, what most of us are doing, what most people are doing, is they're waiting till the end of the year and they're seeing how their year's activities fit into the reporting and then they're reporting on it. Wouldn't it be better if we reported based upon actions and improvements in our soil health, in our farming, and where we've continually progressing and, and you know, trying to keep up with our exponentially growing world based on actions and performance and improvements instead of saying, okay, uh, I've got to do my reporting or I've got to get this report now. Uh, uh, let's see how I, how I measured up with, with the standards or that. And that's a, how, how a lot of us are doing it or how, how it was been done in the past. What if we set little goals or, 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 or performances, positive actions that we can take and do on our farms that at the end of the year, we're reporting positively that there has been a progress from last year or exactly. an improvement made, you know, and that's really the direction we need to go. So I'm in alignment with you. Well, I mean, the tragedy of all this is we don't even have any baseline data. So, you know, if you were to, I've been, I've been here 47 years. If you were to say to me, have you kept accurate records of biodiversity and soil during that time? No, I haven't, I'm embarrassed to say. But if we were required to do that, using a common framework, then this would be fantastic because then I can pride myself, for instance, on improving my soil organic matter and maybe even building soil because I think that's what we've got to do. It's not just about the organic matter content, it's about the total amount of soil. If we can measure those two things, and have baseline data for all farms, then we would know whether the changes in practice, the regenerative systems that we need to introduce are having the desired result. At the moment, we don't know. So we're, I think to your point about rewarding practice, we probably in the beginning do need to reward better practices. So we are having this conversation with the Welsh government. We say, well, how can you reward a regenerative farming system? And the answer that we're suggesting or we're having a discussion about is that first of all, you require farmers, if they're going to get their single farm payment, which we have in Europe, you know, the, the, the area payment, BPS, we call it in the UK, but it's basically the same as in Germany, for instance. You get a payment really just at the moment. It's like a social, social security uh, it's a payment. Subsidy, it's a, yeah. If you don't break the law, you get the money. Yeah. But if this money was conditional upon adopting farming practices which did no harm and part of the condition of the of the receipt of those subsidies was an annual sustainability audit so we start to capture this data then you would become either paid for stewarding what you already have or maybe you could be paid for increasing the soil organic matter or something like, like that this would be wonderful because then farming can come into the discussion about climate change and irreversible biodiversity loss because as Vandana Shiva said in a talk I heard her give a year ago the world used to be covered with rainforests it's not anymore it's covered with farms because we've destroyed the rainforest so really farms are in the front line against addressing climate change and biodiversity loss we have to farm in harmony with nature otherwise we're not going to have an inhabitable planet I totally agree. We, we used to, um, uh, uh, you know, well, probably the right word is not we used to. The, the, the minute we started uh, farming and agricultural practices, especially intensive and since the industrial revolution, we've had the biggest impact on, on our environment. We, you know, tilling and moving rocks and cutting down trees. Uh, is just releasing carbon in the atmosphere, a lot of nitrogen and chemicals and, and, and issues around farming and, and this intensive way of doing it has had a big impact on our environment and our climate. And uh, the United Nations FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization in 2015, 
uh, said, we have 60 harvests left uh, uh, with traditional industrial agriculture. And uh, this year, 2020, it's been updated. It's 45 harvests left with industrial agriculture um, methods, um, intensive farming. And we, we need to make a shift. We're, we're eating our finite resources. We're having a major impact on, on our environment. We, we don't understand true cost, total, total environmental cost as percentage of EBITDA if you're looking at it from a business aspect. Um, and, and we need some substantial changes. Now, you, uh, the, the Sustainable Food Trust <clears throat> is not only educating and doing the reports and, and working with policy and, and governments to try to, to do this, but you've, you mentioned it yourself, you're doing things uh, with farmers from all around the world. You've spoken in San Francisco and in the United States and, and, and done some different events. Um, during this, and I got a tickle on it a little bit with the pandemic, we've been domesticated by agriculture. So agriculture is outside, but we're locked up in our homes or kind of staying put, not traveling so much. During the pandemic, we're on this lockdown, but things that are global citizens are food, environment, wind, air, so uh, uh, water, and uh, species that cross nations and borders, but we're on this lockdown and uh, brings me to this question, how do you feel about this view uh, of global citizenry or that we're all um, uh, crew members on this spaceship earth that we cannot really truly be divided by nations, borders, divisions of humanity, especially when we, we lock, and I don't wanna pick on the United Kingdom at all. Uh, when we lock down a country in, in some regards through a Brexit, through a pandemic lockdown, but yet the amount of food produced outside of the UK and other countries is still pretty substantial, probably four times the size of the United Kingdom. So that whole lockdown procedure or not allowing certain things is just for me un unfathomable because we're all sharing the same arable land, we're sharing uh, the food across the world. And, and so, uh, what are your thoughts on that as far as uh, global citizenry or this kind of different global view of the world? Well, I think it has, um, the pandemic has, what's one of the side effects of the lockdown uh, to remind our, us all of our common humanity. I mean, uh, we're all, it's the great leveler, isn't it? Disease, <laughs> but it also is, it's had such an enormous force. I was just looking, we have a wonderful clear day outside. Uh, and there was one of these rare occasions where it said on the weather forecast this morning on BBC Radio 4, West Wales is gonna have the best weather. And so it is, uh, it's beautiful clear sky out there. And I was just looking normally, first thing in the morning at dawn, we see all the aeroplane trails of the flights coming in from America. And there's hardly any, it's incredible. I mean, it's just changed everything. And weirdly enough, life on the farm hasn't changed nearly so much. I mean, it, it's as if nature is blissfully ignorant of all this stuff that's going on with humanity, human come lately. And the farm, the life of the farm just continues. But I think it is a great teacher. Everything's a teacher. And the pandemic is showing us lots of things, our common humanity, as I've said, and also this nonsense about borders. I mean, it's a shame about Brexit. It's happened. We have to face that, you know, when it rains, the pavements are wet, as my teacher once said. But um, even Boris's father, Stanley Johnson, who I interviewed on a podcast, which is on our website, he is a great European, a great proponent of the European project. So it's a bit ironic that his own son, he used to be an MEP, and uh, his own son is just, you know, who knows why he did it. But anyway, here we are. You had Trump and we've got Boris yeah, and yeah. whatever. And we just have to work with what is. But I think it's clear that we're all united uh, by our humanity on planet Earth. And we need to work together to make it a habitable place for those that follow us. And farming is one of the most important ways we can ch uh, change things. And indeed, if we're just citizens, we all eat. And our eat the act of eating is powerful as Wendell Berry reminds us. So the, this coming um, 
year was actually the launch of the United Nations uh, Food System Summit. It was because of the pandemic was kind of done all online. And next year, they're supposed to do that, not only in Glasgow, but uh, some pre-events about the, the UN Sustainable Food Press. I wanted to know if you're taking part in that as well. So those discussions and, and, and dialogues on more uh, global level on how we, we look at food and farming and and, and things because that's uh, so important. But over the years, we've seen more and more this bubbling to the surface the, that the biggest drawdown factor to get back into the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries is food is and agriculture is really not, I don't like to use the word silver bullet, but it's the biggest drawdown effect that we can kind of get this rebalancing on our planet. And, and we've touched upon it a couple of times that it's really the way they calculate the earth overshoot day is based on a replicable global hectare that provides you with enough water, food, air, shelter, security to live a, a vibrant long life. But per person, we're using uh, an overshoot of that uh, replicable land. Uh, this year, August 20. Second, I believe was Earth overshoot day and uh, the global hectare for 2020 is 1.6 global hectares. And we're using 2.89 uh, uh, or 98 global hectares per person. So it's on a resource overshoot and a deficit, but it's all calculated through this global hectare or acre. You know, I'm sure there's a way to, to calculate it in acres as well that provide us with the basic needs of humanity so, so that we can live within the planetary boundaries, which goes back to the basics, farming, food, how we get our resources. And um, that shift on, on an international basis is really not only bubbling to the surface, but it's beginning to occur as long as I've been with the UN and, and, and different international organizations, I see the topic come up more and more because people are realizing that's the biggest way, like Paul Hawkins said in the drawdown, to have the biggest impact and effect to, to get us back into a balance So uh, for the future yeah. of humanity. And um, I, I really see everything that the Sustainable Food Trust does, speaks about, tries to work on, although a small, small organization is trying to get us into this other awareness and trying to get us policies and, and processes to move us there. And so for that, yeah. I, I thank you. Um, but there are, are, are also some, some controversial things, I guess, some, some ways where you say, uh, I've heard you in the past um, speak with them, whether it's environmentalist George Monboy or, or vegans or whatever, how um, some of that knowledge or understanding of, of how food is produced, about farming, about where we get our food from, um, if it was understood better, if, if we understood how it worked and the difference between industrial agriculture and sustainable farming or regenerative practices, that we would have another view or could maybe even make the shift faster instead of fighting against each yeah. other because really we're aligned. And so I would like to hear more of your comments or thoughts on, on these things because that's also a hurdle that we need to tackle and to get everybody on the same page to, exactly. to reach this critical mass for even better momentum because both tribes so to say are very powerful in and of itself but we're we're not going in different directions we're actually kind of aligned and i think that's what people are missing i agree and just to touch on a couple of the points you made at the beginning of what you just said we're hoping to be at the cop 26 in the un food summit next year and to contribute probably particularly in relation to trying to get an alignment on measuring farm sustainability, because we think that holds a key to addressing climate change and biodiversity loss. So we'll see how we get on with that. Uh, you mentioned Paul Hawken and the Drawdown Project. I'm a fan of Paul's, I think he's a good man. I think it's been said that if we took regenerative farming practices to scale, we might be able to sequester maybe 100 parts per million of CO2 back into the soil, which is the world's second largest carbon sink only after the oceans. And it's probably the one way where in relatively short time, we can really draw down significant amounts of CO2 out of the atmosphere. But to your main point, I think that there is a lot of confusion around. 
everybody agrees with the general discussion that I'm sure I think most people do that we we need to change we need to change our farming and our food systems but I do believe there's quite a lot of confusion around uh, amongst the general public but even amongst people who are particularly interested in these issues about what kind of farming systems which should replace the ones we've got at the moment what those farming systems would produce and therefore what we should eat because my point or our point is that surely we should eat in proportion to what the farming systems which are regenerative which we need to replace the ones we've got at the moment produce because in a way it's very simple and the way I, this is the way i see farming we farmers small or large the farmers of the world we are stewards of the small parcel of natural and human capital over which we have temporary you know, influence and what we need to do is to steward that land and produce as much food as we can which is consistent with maintaining and preferably building that natural and human capital that's actually the task of all farmers throughout the world and particularly now we've cut down most of the rainforest it needs to be a biodiversity reserve a soil carbon reserve um, a place of harmony and beauty but at the same time we still need to produce food now there have been a series of reports that have come out in the last few years i'm going to focus on the eat lancet report not because it's the only one but because it had a massive influence because you know the lancet and the medical community endorsed it and you know gunthild stolladen who's a friend of mine and a you know very influential person in this the eat forum they were all backing this and of course johan rockstrom who is a i'm a fan of johan's and his wonderful work on planetary boundaries but i have to say that i think that the headlines of the eat lancet report caused have caused a great deal of confusion amongst the the eating public which is all of us um because they came out with this kind of notional diet they need they said first of all we need to eat less meat well that's definitely true and we need to move towards a plant-based diet well that probably was always true and it's still true but i think they tended to throw the um the sustainably managed uh grass-fed ruminant um, baby out with the bath water of all the livestock products that we need to stop eating, namely the feedlot beef, the industrial hog production, the industrial chicken production, the mega dairy stuff. We need to stop eating all those products. Of course we do, because they are not consistent with regenerative and sustainable farming practices. However, and I'm speaking now not just about the United Kingdom, but I think about most farms in the world in various different, by various different means, sustainably managed livestock, in my opinion, are a fairly central component of truly regenerative farming systems. And by telling everyone, especially young people who you know, are all going vegan, uh, thinking it's the right thing to do. It's a kind of protest mode. I mean, I was I was a hippie back in the 60s and I was protesting. And I think the modern protest is to go vegan. And you can understand why people would want to go vegan when they see all this horrible industrial livestock production. But they need to have a sophisticated understanding and like the prayer to know the difference between the animals which are part of the solution and those which are part of the problem. And let me give you an example in the United Kingdom. There's a great friend of mine who's got a big arable farm, a tillage farm in the eastern counties. And uh, he's called Hilton Murray Phillipson. And he was in an all arable industrial system. And he, it was on his conscience because he knew it was doing bad. So he converted it to a mixed farm where the fertility building was through grass and uh, legumes. And 50% of his farm has gone into grass. But he's found it very, very difficult to, to stay economically viable with that system because all over the United Kingdom and actually all over the world, people are thinking, well, we certainly don't want to eat red meat anymore. And red meat includes pork, of course, which probably we need to cut down on our eating of pork because it's fed in industrial ways mostly. But red meat especially is seen by people as being lamb and beef. And it's become un-PC to buy lamb and beef. But if it's grass-fed or mainly grass-fed, then actually by eating lamb and beef from those systems of regenerative farming, you're not only helping the farmers, you're critical to their economic survival. Now, I think that the Eat Lancet report did not do a very good job of differentiating between those two kinds of livestock production. 
And I think a lot of damage has been done and a lot of confusion has been caused. So one of the pieces of work that the Sustainable Food Trust has been focusing on is to try to differentiate and get it into the public mind, because in the end, informed public opinion, citizens of planet Earth need to get all this stuff. It might be complex, but they have to get it, because otherwise we won't bring about the changes that are needed. I couldn't have said it nicer, so that, that was beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's definitely a lot of cross-cutting areas that, that uh, we, we need to re raise this awareness and, and uh, make sure that they, uh, it's not them and us that, that we realize that we're all thinking in the same direction. Our intentions are good and we, we, want, we want, to, uh, want to move forward in the right direction. There are a couple other things that came out this year during the pandemic that I wanted to know what your thoughts and feelings and, and if you'd seen them. One was Kiss the Ground. Um, Brilliant film. Yeah, a fabulous film about soil health and, and uh, farming and regenerative practices. But also uh, the Rodale Institute does so many fabulous things uh, uh, around regenerative agriculture and has done some long-term studies. Um, and the reason I bring it up, uh, what's your thoughts? There's a lot of farmers, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, also Croatia, Malta, and, and different places that are still doing in, uh, chemically intensive industrial agriculture and uh, it's extremely hard to talk to them about organics or regenerative practices and making that switch and they're like even you bring it up they're like there's no way that's going to work it's going to be profitable we can make it work. yes yes I mean, the trouble is that it's not wrong the problem is unless we the sit the eaters of planet earth support the kind of food production outputs of those regenerative farming systems, then I would say there's hundreds of thousands of farmers all over the world, say in the Corn Belt or in Eastern Europe in say the Great Plains of Romania where there's all this wonderful soil and um, further east again, and in the Eastern counties of England, they're looking at what it would mean to adopt regenerative practices as advocated in Kiss the Ground. And they're saying, come on, you know, if I introduce a big livestock enterprise on my farm to eat the grass from the fertility building phase of the rotation, I don't have any income from the corn or the grain that I would have grown on that land. I've just got the grass. If I turn that into meat or milk, as we are doing here, uh, the market doesn't want that, or it certainly won't pay enough to make it a viable um, uh, operation. So they're not wrong, these farmers. They're saying, well, I can't do this. It's not going to pay well enough. So we really need to think about these issues and make sure that we realign the government policy, the polluter pays principle, the redirection of subsidies, as we've already discussed, but also what we eat so that we can support the shift towards regenerative farming. I thought Kiss the Ground was a brilliant film. If you haven't watched it, it's on Netflix, just watch it. I also, there's another, another film just come out called Sacred Cow, if you come across that, that's just about to be launched, I think. That's a, I'm on that, and oh, just great. briefly. Um, and I think these films are great because they're explaining some of these issues to a wider public. And unless we get the public on board, these things are not going to change. Are there, are there any advice uh, or tips or help that you could give to farmers currently doing industrial practices who kind of are feeling that they should transition but are, are, are holding to the old system or to holding to industrial system, uh, some advice to transition or some help? ways to get them thinking or looking at it different or tips that they could, would make a transition better or even to get them to think about moving in that direction? I think, um, you know, I feel like quoting Bob Dylan here, uh, you know, the old road is rapidly aging. Get out on the new one if you want to lend a hand because the times they are changing. I think the times are changing. I think that, you know, David Attenborough, wonderful communicator, he is reminding everyone now that we were in the last chance saloon and farming is currently part of the problem. It could become part of the solution. And I, to those intensive farmers, I'd say, have faith, start making the change, try introducing a crop rotation, which includes fertility building without chemical fertilizers and pesticides on at least part of your farm to get the hang of it. Because I think the market and policy change will come to support those new actions. I believe there is, will be an emergent market for carbon. You know, I think the investment community are coming behind this. 
I think banks are changing. I mean, just to give you a couple of examples, we had a meeting with most of the UK supermarkets last week, and they're all interested in adopting this new harmonized framework for measuring sustainability and labeling. Think about that. That's all the UK supermarkets expressing interest in this change. We are also in discussions with one of the major UK banks who are going to trial this farm sustainability assessment because they don't want to loan money to farms who are degenerating their soil. This is, this is big stuff. Yeah. So I think farmers who are thinking about it and worrying about the economics of it, I think start now is the answer because I think things are going to change. I agree. I, I definitely felt the change over the years and, and um, my, I, I come from six generations organic farmers in Germany and, I, and I've really seen substantial changes uh, over the years and it's just getting better. I, uh, we, we, we need to do more positives and have more wins, more actionable things like we discussed instead of just doing the bare minimum or reporting, which could be very tedious and boring. Let's, let's try to to, to make that progress, to, to include those actions to improve our land and our soils. Um, we could get into probably numerous different things on, on, the, on the importance of soil health, biodiversity, the biome of, of our soils and uh, how that ties to the biome of our body, our good gut health, the, the microbes that are, that are vital in that. Uh, Kiss the ground is one that really touches well upon that. So I don't know if we need to rehash that. But just one handful of, uh, of, of, of healthy, good soil really has more microbes than there are uh, human beings on planet Earth. Just one handful. And well, to, I think a, a rather yeah. nice turn of phrase is that yeah. the soil is the stomach of the plant. Yep. The plants don't have an internalized stomach. They have a, an external stomach. And they spend 30% of their photosynthetic energy exuding sugary sap into the root zone which nourishes a symbiotic community of bacteria and fungi upon which their digestion depends. It's exactly the same in the human stomach. We, we host a symbiotic community of bacteria upon which our digestion and our health depends. So when we look at the soil anew, we can imagine it as the collective stomach of all the plants on earth, digesting and feeding and what a beautiful kind of metaphor that is. And uh, it, it just changes one's attitude towards the soil. Absolutely. I, I love that how you, I'm glad you, you, you said that because that's the exact way we need to hear it. Um, I have my hardest question for you today is the burning question, WTF. And it's not the swear word, what we've all been pulling our hair out and yelling this year. Uh, it's what's the future? Well, I think we have to be optimistic. Um, I believe there are certain moments in human history where changes of consciousness happen. I believe that I was part of that, one of those shifts in the 60s, end of the 60s. It was an amazing time. And there was this kind, you couldn't really say where it came from, because you could analyze it, you could say, well, the baby boomers after the Second World War, they all had it so good and they could think in a free way, but it was, that was part of it. But it was the music, it was something was happening here. Uh, this is another quote from Bob Dylan, and you don't know what it is. Ballad of a Thin Man, uh, Highway 61 Revisited. Something is happening now. We don't quite know what it is, but we know there's a consciousness shift going on. So things that would have been inconceivable a few years ago are becoming more possible now. And I do believe that it's important to see this through I think we have to ask ourselves, each of us, every day, what is the higher purpose of my existence on this fragile planet? What am I serving with my life? What, what higher cause should I be serving? There's something important about maintaining this thin film of organic life which surrounds the planet and making it more beautiful and harmonious. And uh, the late environmental campaigner, Doug Tompkins, I had that kind of a view who I had the great privilege to know. And he said, if something isn't beautiful, it probably won't function properly. So we need to enhance the beauty of the earth. and We need to serve our inner search. Whatever, however that manifests, whether it manifests in a faith or some sort of spiritual search, I think this higher purpose of humanity and the collectiveness of our 
striving to make the earth habitable for our children. This is a spiritual dimension to things, but I think we need to sit in front of that every day. Maybe we should sit in, sit in front of it and be mindful and meditate and just feel the experience of our interconnectedness with nature. And I think if we do that, we will be inspired uh, to undertake right action in our day job and you know, in our work in the world, because I think the two are connected. And I do feel optimistic because I believe that many people are thinking this way right now. I have three last questions for you and they're kind of self, uh, uh, selfless or selfish questions for my listeners. They're um, takeaways that they could use or apply in their life to help them on the shift or to, to, to see the planet differently, things that you've experienced. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners, a sustainable takeaway that has, truly has the power to change their life, uh, what would it be, your message? Well, I've got a, it's got to be a food message because food's my subject. And I shall quote Wendell Berry again, eating is an agricultural act, he said. He is right, was right, is right. Um, we have power to improve our health and to reverse the decline in biodiversity and build soil health and carbon every day when we eat food. So because we're the cell in the food system, which is global, uh, Cellular health is where we start, microcosm, macrocosm. So we have the capacity to understand everything and change everything with our own lives and we can start with what we eat. So when you uh, next buy food, make sure you know the story behind it. Make sure it comes from a regenerative and sustainable system, preferably not too far from where we live if that's possible. And uh, if you just do those simple things and eat the food which comes from regenerative farming systems, ideally from farmers you know, then you will be part of the change. I love that. We, we both saw each other. I don't know if you remember in 2017, I, I believe it was, at, uh, or 2017 yeah, at the Eat Farm in, in Stockholm. Um, and there was a gentleman there, Ron Finley as well. He always says, growing your own food is like printing your own money and, and that's a more modern way of, yeah. of putting what you said but it's it's so true there's so much power resilience so much security and and changing that if people really knew that that we've given our stewardship to grow and produce food over to others we we don't even know where it comes from and it's it's their job and, and, and that stewardship uh, was misplaced to give it to them because some of them are doing it just as cheap as possible, which is cheapening life and, and affecting our human health in many different ways. My next question is, um, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey as a farmer? And, and, and you probably want to mention as well that, that along with, with your farm in Wales, you've also had other full-time jobs. You've been doing other things. So it's like you, you've, you've got a couple paths and jobs that you're working at the same time and uh, it, it's hard work. Um, what have you experienced in this journey that you would have loved to known from the start? Well, I'm not sure. I think what, I think, um, I did know this at the start in some intuitive way, but I think I can affirm that if you have a, a deep intuitive desire to do something new and maybe slightly disruptive, it's definitely right to do it. You know, I mean, what we did that when we were a community of six people who got back to the land here in 1973 from London, because I grew up in London, I mean, it was a mad thing to do. You know, we, there was no sense in it. Everybody would have said, well, you certainly shouldn't do that, but we did it anyway. I'm so glad we did uh, because I've learned so much. And I think that um, every day brings a, a new opportunity to learn. You know, we, we're reduced and we're, we're all so frail. That's the thing that strikes me. Our human frailty, you know, our emotional roller coaster, which goes on a daily cycle. And, you know, at times we feel kind of, as if we're invincible and other times we feel absolutely devastated and dark and that's the truth isn't it about being a human being we have to stay with these we have to be in front of these things bear them and learn from them and I think there's so much uh, possibility of uh, doing good work 
um, not by feeling a victim of difficulty, because it is lawful that uh, the world is going to be difficult at times. The thing that perhaps I should mention in connection with all this is a book written by Prince Charles about more than 10 years ago now called Harmony, A New Way of Looking at Our World. And I know the prince and I once said to him, why did you write this book? And he said, I wrote it entirely from my intuition. And uh, his the Harmony book is basically saying that throughout human history and eternity, everything is governed and um, informed by geometric mathematical laws which express themselves in all things everywhere, whether it's the movement of, of planetary bodies around stars and suns, whether it's the Fibonacci sequence expressing itself in the growth of plants or in the structure of the human ear, um, the geometry and the maths of things, uh, how the ancient civilizations understood this and put those principles into the design of the great Gothic cathedrals, whether you're talking about music, the music of Bach, all these laws and principles are expressed in us and all around us and we forgot them. And to rediscover or to look at farming through the lens of harmony is my current revelation. I've been farming as best I've known how in a regenerative way, organic way for many years now. But I'm suddenly realizing that this little ecosystem that I'm managing is also informed by these fundamental laws and principles, but I didn't see it. And I think this is a, this is a revelation for me. And I'm excited by that because I feel it can inform better action. And by the way, just to say, it's not just about harmony. There's also discord and disruption as we know as we see in the world. And somehow we need to embrace the discord and disruptive tendencies which manifest everywhere in cycles and in wars and all the rest of it as part of this striving towards making the world more harmonious. It's not, a, it is a bad, there are bad things that happen, but somehow they're part of a bigger understanding of the world. So that's what I feel is most important for us all really. I don't think I'm describing something which is particular to some sort of, you know, religion or faith or anything. I think these are more universal laws I'm speaking about. It's, a, it's more interconnection uh, with our world, with our biome, with, with life. And I, I, um, you've already answered my last question, but I, what, what you said so nicely ties to something else. I wanted to uh, see if you heard about it or what your thoughts or feelings were. And that is Lynn Margulis, which uh, was Carl Sagan's first wife, uh, as a, a famous scientist that uh, she's no longer alive, but she really termed this, uh, coined this term of a symbiotic earth or symbiosis and this uh, uh, way of realizing that we're in cooperation and collaboration with everything else on our world, not other species, but the microorganisms in our soil, that we are part of this earth and that we're really intertwined. And, the Harmony Project, which you just explained, and based upon Prince Charles' book, The Harmony of a New Way of Looking at Our World, and the, the vision and your aims as that project, for me, uh, uh, are just in, in alignment. I'm a big fan of Lynn Margulis and the symbiotic Earth and, and, and how she uh, discovered the, the, the uh, mycorrhiza and um, um, the connectedness of our of our soils and, and microorganisms in, in our earth. And, and, and if we realize that uh, no matter what, we crawled out of the primordial soup of this planet, we are part of this earth and those microorganisms in our bodies, we have more um, in common with our planet than we do with us as humans. The, the human genes and cells are, are not as much in our bodies and uh, connect us as much as the microbials, genes and cells in our bodies connect us with our planet and other species and with the oak tree or with uh, ruminants uh, uh, on our planet. And so it's really nice to see the way you guys have, have presented this project, how your harmony practitioners and uh, the interconnectedness of, of life and the dynamic balance that we have to really play this dance or this this nice uh, um, life here with, with our planet. That's all the, the questions I have. If there's anything you did not get to say, I would love to hear it now or if you have any questions for me personally, but it's been a sheer pleasure, Patrick. I really thank you. 
Well, um, just to say on the Harmony Project, there's a man called Richard Dunn, who a, was a head teacher at a primary school, elementary school, uh, who read the book, the Prince's book, and decided he wanted to change uh, the way in which he taught his children without losing his very high educational status. And he is now heading up our Harmony education work. So uh, it's really powerful because he's written a, a manual for a teacher of an elementary school as how you can embed this new approach to teaching week by week, month by month, without compromising you know, the ed educational attainment of the children. All that's available on our website. You can go to the Harmony bit of our website. Um, follow us on Sus Food Trust or Instagram. If you want to know more about my farm here, Hafod Cheese, H-A-F-O-D Cheese is our Instagram, or you can visit our Holden Farm Dairy website. It's a wealth of information on the Sustainable Food Trust. But uh, thank you very much for this so wonderful uh, conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much, Patrick. And I will definitely put in the show notes all your links, all your websites. Uh, I would encourage people to go read the book. I have go to go to the website to download some of the reports. They're all free. And uh, I guarantee you, not only from our discussion, but from the wisdoms that you can find there, the plethora of resources, uh, you, you will have a different look at, at the view of food and, and, and life. And, and I thank you for this mission you've been on for many years now and all you've brought to our world. And I'm so glad that we're working together. W uh, one last thing that my listeners probably don't know is uh, unless they've been to my website, uh, Menu B, is I've got a book coming out the end of this year, Menu B, People and Planet Food Saving Solutions. And you're going to give us a nice contribution to that book as well. And so I hope we can get some of the things we talked about today and some many other wonderful projects in, into the book as well so that everybody can really shift this paradigm and get us in the right direction of living in harmony with our planet. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.